kind of a cool thing, jumping up and down. And it's a very distinct structure that the cell would be able to recognize. It. So I tell this to you to encourage you at whatever field you're in to get out, to do undergraduate research, and you can do great things. You never know how things may turn out. That was one example. Okay. So we've got A form, we've got B form, we've got Z form. That's a terrible figure. Okay, we won't use that figure. Now, this is another terrible figure. I'm going to try to paint a mental picture of this for you so that you can better understand what we've got going on. Okay? Let's imagine, let's think about this double helix. Oh, look at this. Just like somebody left it here just for me to use this. Let's imagine I've got a double helix. Well, this isn't going to work very well, but uh, I use my I'm doing this on the spot here. And I've got a double helix, right? Two strands interwound with each other. Let's say I take one of those strands and I start wrapping and wrapping and wrapping and wrapping. What's going to happen to this guy? It is going to get all kinky and coiled, right? That's exactly. I didn't. I didn't put this up here, by the way. It was kind of cool. It was here. All right. It's going to get very kinky and coiled. It turns out that when you get messing with DNA in the cell, what happens is it gets very kinky and coiled. When you go to replicate DNA, for example, one part of the DNA is being pulled apart. And if you don't do something about pulling that apart, what happens is all those kinks start adding up ahead of where replication occurs, and the DNA can literally tie itself in a knot. Not a good move, because once it's tangled up, the cell can't replicate it. Okay? That phenomenon that I've just described to you, where we sort of overwind the strands, is referred to as supercoiling. Supercoiling. The normal structure of B-form DNA is 10.5 base pairs per turn. What does that mean? If I go one rotation of the helix, one rotation of the helix, 10.5 base pairs to that. That's the form that DNA really prefers to be in. It's called the relaxed form. So 10.5 base pairs per turn gives us relaxed DNA. If I alter that number, and it turns out if I reduce it, I have the same problem by making it less than 10.5 base pairs per turn or more. Either way, I put the DNA under tension. And that tension gives rise to supercoiling. Now, we'll talk about that more when I talk about DNA replication. But supercoiling is something that the cell has to deal with all the time. Fortunately, we have enzymes that deal with that supercoiling. Because if we did not, we could not replicate our DNA. Everybody have supercoiling, a, a picture of supercoiling in your head? So if we alter that 10.5 base pairs per turn by pulling the strands apart or doing something like that, we are going to upset the supercoiling. Well, there are fortunately enzymes called topoisomerases. And I'm, I'm going to spell that for you. T-O-P-O-I-S-O-M-E-R-A-S-E-S. -E -E -S. T-O-P-O-I-S-O-M-E-R-A-S-E-S. -E -E topoisomerases. Now, topoisomerases are enzymes that help DNA to change its base pairs per turn. It helps DNA to get into a state that it's more relaxed in. It doesn't let it get fully relaxed, and we'll see why that's the case, or I'll tell you why that's the case in a minute. But if it has too much supercoiling, then it helps to reduce that. Now, one of the enzymes, one of the topoisomerases that do that is called DNA gyrase, and that's what this, that's why this, uh, somewhere is labeled gyrase on here, okay? So DNA gyrase is a topoisomerase. And I'm going to tell you more about what that does when I talk about DNA replication. But I want you to know that DNA gyrase is a topoisomerase. And a topoisomerase is helping to deal with all of that uh, extra tension that's in there, all those extra turns and so forth that are in that DNA. So. It does. So topoisomerases kind of help to deal with too much of either situation. Yes? 
Supercoiling can happen either positive or negative supercoiling, and if it differs from 10.5, it's going to be supercoiled. So if it's less or, or more, either way. Uh, it's a little hard to envision, to envision. Come to my office and I'll be happy to tell you. But so suffice it to say that both will cause the thing to kink up. Okay? Both will cause it to kink up. It is a little hard to envision, though. I'll, I'll tell you that. Okay. Questions? Yes? What is the what? The exact role of DNA gyrase is to act as a topoisomerase and relieve that superhelical tension. So we're talking about superhelical tension. That's what a topoisomerase does. It, it alleviates that. Okay. And we'll see when I talk about DNA replication why that's important. Yes, ma'am. Isomerase. There is. There is a range. So it doesn't go fully relaxed. And I'll tell you right now, one of the reasons it doesn't, okay? One of the reasons it doesn't go fully relaxed is having some tension in there keeps that DNA kind of compact. You saw how those bands got kind of kinked up, right? A little bit of kinking is good. And the reason it's good is it occupies a smaller space. So one of the ways we compact DNA is with supercoiling. Bacteria do this a lot. Bacteria are pretty tiny. They supercoil their they have a circular uh, DNA. They supercoil their, super, their circular DNA, and it fits in a smaller space as a result. So they don't want to completely make it relax, or it's just going to splay all out. OK? All right. Let's see. Where are we? Now, let's talk about DNA uh, wrapping itself up. Okay. I said that if we took all the DNA in one of your cells, one single one of your cells, you've got seven feet of DNA. An incredible amount of DNA in a cell that's smaller than your eye can see. So you know it's not just laying there. It has to somehow be wrapped up so that it can fit inside of the nucleus, which is about the size of a bacterial cell. Tremendous amount of DNA. There's a thousand times more DNA in your nucleus than there is in a bacterial cell of about the same size. Wow, it's going to be pretty tight in there. We've got to make things fit. Well, it turns out that eukaryotic cells, remember eukaryotes are the higher cells like humans, plants, animals, yeast. Those are all eukaryotic cells. They all have nuclei. They all have to tightly pack that DNA. So they have to do some things to their DNA that prokaryotic cells do not have to do. Okay? Setting the stage here. So one of the things they do is they wrap the DNA up using proteins. Proteins. Okay? There are proteins that specifically bind to DNA, and they're called histones. H-I-S-T-O-N-E-S. -E histones are positively charged proteins, and DNA is a negatively charged molecule. Nice match, right? One of the things that histones do is, is they have, um, and not that they do, but that they have, one of the reasons that they're positively charged is they have a lot of lysine residues in them. Lysine is the amino acid that you recall that has a positive R group. A positive R group. So at physiological pH, Histones are pretty positively charged. DNA is pretty negatively charged. And so this coiling process is very, very uh, much favored. Okay? The thing that we see as a chromosome is actually a complex of histones and DNA. So a chromosome is not just DNA. It's proteins plus DNA. So anytime we talk about DNA and proteins in a chromosome, we refer to that, that association as chromatin, C-H-R-O-M-A-T-I-N, chromatin, okay? So chromatin, chromatin is just something that has proteins associated with DNA, histones and DNA. Now, 
these guys have to get ordered into very uh, complex arrays. Not only do we have to wrap it into little balls like we see here, we have to wrap the little balls together and then the wraps of the little balls together and bigger and bigger and bigger. So these giant arrays of complexes of these guys help to compress the size of the DNA by, order, by, by several orders of magnitude. Okay? Several orders of magnitude so that it will fit in the confines of the nucleus. That means that it's very complicated in a eukaryotic cell if you want to replicate the DNA. Because in replicating the DNA, what do you have to do? You have to pull the strands apart. Imagine pulling the strands apart when you've got them all wrapped up with protein and so forth. Okay. It's very complicated. Very, very complicated. Okay. So that's what's happening with chromatin. Questions about that? Yes, sir. Does it make it take longer to reproduce? It's a very good question, and in fact, it does, but partly because it's a lot longer than it is in bacteria. So bacteria don't have this. Bacteria have basically bare DNA. They don't have proteins sitting on there. I'll give you an idea. In a bacterial cell, an E. coli cell in your, in your stomach can replicate, if, it's, if there's plenty of food around, it can completely replicate its DNA in 20 minutes. Okay. I'll give you some other numbers with that in a little bit when I talk about DNA replication, but in 20 minutes. For us to replicate all of the DNA in our cells, okay, if we have one cell to replicate, it's on the order of 24 hours. Okay? So it takes a lot longer. It's a lot longer time to go through and do that process. Okay? Yes, Lynette. Confirm or deny? <laughs> The DNA has to be wrapped up to fit in the nucleus of a eukaryotic cell. That's correct. There's no nucleus in a prokaryotic cell. Yeah. Okay? All right. So that's kind of cool. And maybe we should have a song. This is a short one. A short one. It's Friday. We should have a song. Okay? About histones. Okay? I'm sure you guys know, all know this tune. The tune is Histones, tiny histones, wrap up eukaryotic DNA. Using lysine side chains, they arrange a chromatin array. With them, DNAs of seven feet fit inside the nucleus so sweet. When you use the histones, you have to deal with condensation and its ablation inside your chromosomes. Okay. I can't claim credit. Actually, I wrote that, but somebody else gave me the idea for it, so that's why there's credit for him on there. Okay. Um, let's say one more thing about DNA, then we'll move to RNA. DNA um, has a property that is interesting and useful in the laboratory. What is it that holds the strands together? Well, it's the hydrogen bonds between the bases, right? Two hydrogen bonds for, for AT, three hydrogen bonds for GC. Hydrogen bonds are relatively weak forces. We think back to proteins, and I said hydrogen bonds help stabilize some structures of proteins. How did we destabilize those hydrogen bonds in proteins? Heat. Heat is a really good way to do it. Okay? Well, it turns out heat is a very good way to destabilize the hydrogen bonds in DNA. So what happens if you do that? Well, you start heating it up. What you see is you have something that has a uh, double helical nature. And you get to a, 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 what's called a transition temperature, and you start seeing change. And notice we're, we're plotting the absorbance of light on the y-axis, and we're plotting the temperature. So we get to a certain point, and all of a sudden we see a change, and now we're up here. What does this tell us? It tells us, first of all, that single strands, that's what you get when you pull apart double strands, absorb light more strongly than do double strands. That's called the hyperchromic effect. Hyperchromic, H-Y-P-E-R-C-H-R-O-M-I-C. 
And that means that the single strands absorb